Welcome to the New York Times In College webcast. I am Daniel Malvey from Gutman Community College of the City University of New York, sitting in for Kathleen O'Connell. I am the editor-in-chief of the Fast Times NYC, Gutman's online newspaper. We are pleased to have Bill Roden with us today. He is a sports columnist for the Times, where he has been writing for, about sports since 1983. His topic is self-awareness. You may ask questions by typing them into the player page on your computer screen. I will, I will read them to Mr. Roden after his remarks. Gutman Community College students attending in person will also have the opportunity to ask questions. And with that, Bill Roden. Hi. Uh, hello, everybody. This is going to be kind of odd because we've got a live audience that's to my right and left, but I'm speaking to you in the camera. So for my live audience, I'm not ignoring you, but I'm playing to the larger crowd. So, <laughs> uh, so um, actually today I'm going to speak uh, about, um, you mentioned self-awareness, but I'm actually going to speak about leadership. Uh, today, um, and I think it's a very, it's something very appropriate, it's something I've been thinking about um, for quite a while, uh, but particularly in light of something, uh, one of the major news stories has just occurred uh, in sports, has been something that's kind of blown up in the NFL um, about hazing, in particular in Miami with the Miami Dolphins, uh, two, two young men, um, quote unquote, two young men, uh, Richie Incognito, uh, and uh, Jonathan Martin uh, have sort of gone from the obscurity of being offensive linemen to suddenly being the, the face of what, goes, what happens when an organization lacks leadership. Uh, it's been a very uh, interesting case, and, and um, I hope we have a, a, a good discussion about it because I think it's, um, although it is something that seems to be a football issue, I think it's really a a societal issue uh, in what I often see is sort of um, a lack of, of a lack of leadership at a number of levels our, our, our political leaders um, but for this case um, in sports for those of you who don't know uh, Richie Incognito uh, is a veteran uh, NFL lineman uh, who's had a very very troubled past which ironically makes him ideal an ideal candidate to play in the National Football League um, it's an odd thing that sometimes in sports, what many of us consider typically bad behavior makes you very marketable in sports, and it's kind of this tension. Um, Richie Incognito is a seven-year veteran. Uh, I think he was a left guard. And his, um, depending on which story you read or not, one of his best friends or enemies or uh, mentee was a, a kid named uh, Jonathan Martin, who was... 6'5", 350 pounds. Uh, he uh, went to Stanford, he was in the second year, and his parents were both Harvard graduates. I think his grandfather was a Harvard graduate. And I only mention that because that's gonna kinda come into play in, in this whole episode. Well, <clears throat> what happened, and it sort of caught all of us by, off guard, and clearly it caught the National Football League off guard, uh, was that uh, in every organization, uh, particularly in, in, in sports, um, there's, uh, there, there are these rituals. I don't know how many of you pledge or have pledged, uh, but uh, there are rituals. There are these first-year rituals that to become a member of the, of the crowd, of the sorority, of the team, you pledge. It could range from anything from getting somebody's water to getting paddled to things that we probably can't mention in a webcast. Uh, and what happened with the Dolphins, apparently, is something that happens a lot in football. Uh, but um, it really exploded in Miami, because number one, Jonathan Martin is not a, a rookie. He's in the second year. But um, suddenly, this guy who was starting for two years just left camp. He just left. And Nobody kind of knew why, and then as the details start kind of coming out, it's that this guy incognito uh, was just was a nightmare to him. He um, he insulted him, he verbally abused him, and apparently with the um, with the acknowledgement and even the uh, um, agreement uh, of his teammates, and apparently it all blew up when one day he came to eat at the table with the other lineman. And then as soon as he sat down, everybody left. Now, that seems pretty innocuous, but apparently there had been this 
pattern of behavior. And this just culminated. So finally he said, I had enough. I don't want this anymore. So he left. He just left. He went home to California to his mama. And um, uh, he went home and, um, and suddenly a lot of reporters, and that's kind of what we do, we began asking questions. Why would a guy who's making a lot of money, who's all American at Stanford, been starting for two years, um, why would he leave? And it came out that he had just become very miserable with the with the, uh, what has become standard operating procedure in a National Football League locker room where uh, rookie players do a number of things. Uh, one of the things you do is you pay, uh, you pay for everybody's dinner. And apparently one of his dinners came to about $60,000 uh, once they took a trip to Los, Ange uh, to Las Vegas and he was supposed to pay for the trip. Uh, like a, I think another sixty, seventy thousand dollars. You know, just these things come out, and it seems kind of ridiculous. But these are these standards. Well, so what does this have to do with leadership? Number one, this I think that what had become hush hush in the National Football League and probably the NBA and hockey and everywhere else about these ha these hazing standards became an issue of not so much hazing but bullying. Because remember, Jonathan Martin was not a a rookie anymore, he was a sophomore. So what had become a first year hazing now turned into bullying, where a guy like Incognito, who apparently is pretty much out of his mind, I mean, going back to Nebraska, where he was kicked off the team for going off on a coach and going off on players. Then he left Nebraska to go to Oregon. He lasted for about a week, where he went off on players. Then he went somewhere, you know, I mean, everywhere this guy has been, there's been problems. Well, clearly, he had some type of personality disorder. Unfortunately, in football, a general manager said, ah, that's just the guy we need. A couple of teams passed on him, but Moore obviously said, wait a minute, <laughs> we want this guy. And so, uh, but, but it brought into question the issue of bullying. And so, so, what, what are, so, so the two things I'm going to talk about today in the time is one is this idea of leadership and what leaders should have done to step in. But the larger concept is a tension we have in sports between ethics and morality, all right? So, so let's get to this whole bullying issue. And, and again, the concept and whether it's at the New York Times or the Miami Dolphins, this is an instance of, of, of what happens, uh, how a lack of leadership can destroy a football team, a news organization, or a family. Um, so, I guess the, the, the big question is sort of what is leadership? And, and I'm not going to really get into that. Maybe that will come up in the questions. But leadership has so many tentacles. I, I think the, the thing I can't answer is what leadership requires. Okay? Leadership requires three basic things. Uh, it requires courage. Leadership requires self-confidence. And leadership requires good judgment. And leadership requires having standing in the community. Um, so let, let's, let's take the first one. Uh, why do you say leadership requires uh, courage? Well, on most, and I've, I've been doing this, uh, I've been a sports writer at the New York Times for 32 years, um, which every time I say that, is, that's another podcast, but that's another. But, um, and over the time, I've seen championship teams, championship locker rooms. I've seen losing teams and losing locker room at the NFL, NBA level, all the way down to high schools. And you kind of get a sense of why certain teams are great and successful and why certain teams uh, are not. Um, when I played, uh, Neil mentioned that I played college football at Morgan State College, which is a historically black university. And when I went to Morgan, uh, they had won 32 straight games. At that point, they, they had the longest winning streak in the country at that time, at the small colleges. And one of the things that struck me immediately, I went from a, a high school that had only won two games every year to this team that had won like 32 straight. And one of the things I noticed is that when you walk into this college setting, there are guys who were on the team who had never lost a game. They were seniors, and they had never lost. And what they did to a lot of the freshmen, they sat before I even met with the, the head coach. It was the seniors and upperclassmen who sat us all down and said, this is what's expected of you. This is behavior that's acceptable. This is behavior that's not acceptable. 
And sometimes with us, we're 18 years old, we do silly things. And it wasn't the coach who stopped in. It was the juniors and the seniors that stopped in. And they stopped and said, this is not what we do here. And it was the seniors and it was the people on the team, the leaders of the team that corrected us immediately. And I found that the mark of a good organization or a good team or, is that much of the leadership comes from the senior people. Uh, in your case, it would be, might be the upper class people. That's where the leadership comes in before it even gets to the level of the head coach or the chairman of the department. The leadership is, is done by a, a, a core of veterans who have a sense of what's right or wrong. What we saw in Miami is that the people who you thought would be the core, number one, this guy incognito had been appointed as one of the leaders. That was the first flaw. That was a flaw from the very top all the way down to put somebody in a leadership position who was not a leader. Um, the, the, the second thing is I said, um, uh, uh, just to, to get back to the, the, the final point about that core, what a core of leadership will do is step in. They'll intercede. This core knows about the rituals and the traditions, but when they see somebody going too far, this core will step in and say, listen, enough, okay, enough, back off. And trust me, if the Miami Dolphins knew then what they know now, there would have there been senior people on that team who would have reacted and said, listen, this is larger than you. This is going to affect us. So there was a breakdown in the core. The second thing is um, uh, self-confidence. Uh, why, why does it take self-confidence to be a leader? Many of you, we've probably all been in situations, uh, could be on the street, it could be anywhere, where you see something going down that's wrong. Could be someone having their pocketbook stolen, uh, three kids jumping one. And how many times have you seen something go down, but you lay back? You don't immediately do the right thing. You, you don't immediately stop what's going on and that you know is wrong. And you don't stop it either because you don't want to distinguish yourself, you don't want to risk anything, you don't want to break from the crowd. Well, leadership means having enough self-confidence to instantly see that something's wrong and correct what is wrong and having the courage and self-confidence to, to know that, um, to have a sense of yourself, to not worry about what you think or what you think or what anybody else thinks, but know this is the right thing. And again, in Miami, uh, there was a breakdown. There was a breakdown of there were people who knew that uh, this incognito player was going too far, but lacked the confidence, uh, lacked the sense of right or wrong to intercede. So that's the second thing is, um, uh, self-confidence. The third thing is good judgment. Good judgment. Sometimes you have to know when to just leave things alone or when to intercede. And sometimes good judgment takes, uh, takes time. Sometimes it just takes maturity. Uh, sometimes it takes, but it also takes wisdom to know when to intercede when to let it play out, when to let it take care of itself. And that's, again, that's the mark of a great either head coach or, or a great uh, executive, a great chair of a department, or just an individual, is having the, the wisdom to know kind of what to do. You know, if, if probably your families, look at the microcosm. You know, brother says, when do you intercede? When do you, hey, you guys just fight it out. When do you break it up? And so that's another thing is good judgment. Um, the other thing is having standing, having standing in the community. Um, what do I mean by standing? Sometimes um, you may have been somewhere for 15 years or 20 years or 30 years. And with that uh, comes um, a respect. People just simply respect you because of what you've done in the past, your body of work. And maybe you don't speak a lot, but when you speak, people tend to listen. Um, you have standing. Um, there was clearly no standing in the Miami Dolphins locker room. 
part of this the league has brought on itself because of free agency that in the old days when players were kind of like serfs on a plantation and they were kept players were kept there for 10 15 years until the team got, decided to get rid of them well with free agency every three four or five years there's a turnover so unfortunately you don't have a situation where you've got a core of people who have been there for five ten fifteen years and when new players come in there's sort of this you know there's this um, uh, foundation of leadership. So, so, so in Miami, each of these things, there was a breakdown on every level. And it came from ownership all the way down. And it's almost, it's almost a classic case of an organization that's bereft of leadership. From the ownership who said, I had no idea. And that's always a telltale sign of a lack of leadership when somebody at the very top said, I had no idea. Uh, the general manager, uh, apparently when the owner, when the, when the agent or the player of, John, of Nelson uh, called and said, this guy's being harassed, the agent, the general manager said, well, my suggestion is that Martin just hits this guy in the mouth. That was, that was a general manager's suggestion. When the agent called and said, my client is being bullied, the general manager said, yeah, well, you know what? I think he should just knock the guy in the mouth. Not what you say. That's completely, again, but again, he is a person in a leadership position. Well, I guarantee you in a few months he will be in an ex-leadership position. Um, and finally, the head coach. The, ke the head coach said that he had no idea that this was going on. He had no idea. Uh, that's, again, one of the telltale signs of a poor leader is no accountability when you say you don't know what's going on. So... The story is still ongoing, but I thought it was a, a trip. And, and although it's a sports, it's a sports story. It really has nothing to do with sports. It has to do with the leadership and the lack of leadership. Uh, the, the 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 last thing that's actually a larger thing that that flows into is these concepts of ethics and morality. Um, and 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 I'll explain just in a second how that leads into this leadership issue. We've all heard the concept, right, of ethics. And morality, and, and oftentimes uh, these terms are used interchangeably, some ethics and morality. But in sports, there's a clash between ethics and morality. And, and this, I mean, and, and I'll explain it by using two examples. An example of Derrick Rose, who was a basketball player for the uh, Chicago Bulls, and RG3, who was a football player for the Washington team. By the way, I'm not using the Washington team's nickname, which I think is racist. And I think part of leadership, by the way, just as a side thing, is if you think something is wrong, you stop using it. I happen to think that the R word, the Wash R word, is wrong and is racist. So I am just simply going to stop using it. In the columns I write and when I speak, I'm just going to simply say the Washington team. You know, anyway. Um, RG3 is a quarterback for the, for the Washington team. And, you know, the ethics, the ethics of sports is what? The ethics of sports is that you play when you're hurt. That's one of the fundamental cornerstones in sports. Play when you're hurt. So RG3 last year was, was hurt terribly. And he played through it. And he played through it to the point during a playoff game, he could barely walk. Now, ethically, he was abiding by the rules of sport, that you play when you're hurt. But morally, his coach had a responsibility morally to say, listen, you're, you're hurting yourself, you're hurting your future, you're hurting us too. Son, I'm going to sit you down. I'm going to sit you down. That was the moral thing to do. The ethical thing to do was, well, you know what? He's playing when he's hurt. He's a soldier. He's, you know, and he's doing the right thing. Morally, the head coach is wrong, and as a result, the quarterback uh, will probably never be the same. He'll probably have a decent career, but he will never be the same. Why? Because there was a moral lapse. Now let's go to Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose was hurt. Now, ethically, Derrick Rose did not do the right thing, right? Because he said, you know what? I'm hurt. I'm not playing. And there was this outcry around the league. So wait a minute. You're a wimp. And they said worse than that. But for the, they said, you're a wimp. 
You know, your team needs you. You know, ethically, he was bound to do what? Play. But morally, he said, I've got a moral obligation to myself, to my family, because I've got a long career. Morally, I'm not going to play. And so he didn't. And I think time will tell that probably he did the right thing. So there's this, this, this clash in sports between the ethics in sport and the morality of sports. And I think each one is determined by, I think, a sense of leadership. In the case of RG3, it was a breakdown of leadership of Mike Shanahan, the head coach, who was unable to, st to step back and say, you know what, I do want to win this playoff game. I'm under heat to get fired. Uh, but you know what? Uh, he who walks and runs away lives to fight another day. RG3, sit down. But he didn't say that. He said, keep playing, keep playing, keep playing almost irreparable harm to his knee, and the franchise is going to pay. In Chicago, the head coach and the administration and the, uh, and the, uh, the Chicago Bulls organization stood by Derrick Rose. They said, you know what? You know your body. You're much more valuable to us than one, two, a three-series game. By the way, against the team, we're probably not going to beat anyway. So you know what? Shut it down, and we'll see you next season. So... Uh, kind of in, in, in wrapping this part of it up, I, I think that um, uh, in sports particularly, you have a lot of examples of, of how important leadership is, but also what can happen to an organization, uh, whether it's in sports or otherwise, that is uh, devoid of leadership. So um, I'd actually like to hear from uh, I think the audience and in audience, because I think that for your generation, particularly those of you who are 19, 20, 22, 23, I think that this whole question of leadership is probably going to be one of the defining things of your generation is defining what leadership is uh, and how we could basically strengthen organizations, or if you don't have it, can destroy organizations. So uh, with that, I'd A, like to thank you guys for, for listening, but I'd, I'd also uh, welcome uh, your comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Roden. Um, I think we should start off by asking, uh, what do you think about this comment? Um, being a leader makes you a target. Well, absolutely. But that's why I said one of the first things is what? Courage. You have to have courage because you're right. Once you become a leader, you are going to be a target. And I don't know if the question comes from a sense of fear or courage, but you're absolutely right. And, and, the, and the reality is that most people are not leaders. You, you know what I mean? I mean, most people are not, most people follow. Most people are looking for somebody to lead and looking for somebody to attack. But that's why being a leader, you know, takes, takes vision and takes courage. Are you surprised that bullying and the lack of leadership occurs with adults and professionals? Uh, I, you know, I think that, I, I mean, I was surprised to be honest with you, that a, a guy who's 6'5", 200, you know, 350 pounds said that he was bullied. I mean, that, that's probably wasn't, that probably shouldn't be my first reaction, <laughs> but that was my reaction. But I think that if you give him the benefit of the doubt and he said, listen, I'm not here to, to, to fight. I'm here to play football and all that. And what this guy was doing, you know, he, in other words, he was challenging me. He wanted me to fight. I'm not doing that. I'd rather leave and go home then do that. So uh, I, at first I was, a little, I was a little surprised, but when you get deeper into it, I think he acted with a lot of, uh, a lot of courage and integrity. There were rumors that the coaching staff in Miami actually edged this on. Do you feel that they're at fault here? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, excuse me. Yeah, I, I, no, I absolutely think that the Miami coaching staff, the administrative office, and the ownership were at fault. And uh, yeah, that's part of the rumor is that what happened was uh, that the coach and, and anybody who's been on a team in a locker room, they'll say, hey, this, why don't you, you know, this guy needs to be toughened up a little bit. They just happened to say it to somebody who's a moron, you know, who had no sense of, <laughs> you know, no sense of uh, decorum and when to stop. So, uh, no, no, I, I think there were no, there are no innocent parties in there, maybe with the exception of, of uh, Martin. Why do you think the Hayes process in Miami was so severe in this case? 
Well, you know, we say the question, do I think it was severe? We don't know. We don't know how severe it was compared to what. This could basically be what was standard across the board in the NFL. Uh, I just think what happened is that you had a high-profile player uh, who left, you know, who just decided to leave, and, and it began to shine uh, it, it began to shine attention. I think that I'm not sure how severe it was. I think it probably goes on across the board, though I, I guarantee you it's going to stop. Next year it's going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> who, are pe who are people in sports that you would say exhibit great leadership qualities and why? Um, I think uh, it, it, for different reasons. I, mean, I think Kobe Bryant, now, I mean, you might, people might say, what? I'm talking about on <laughs> the court, <laughs> you know, on the field of play. I think Kobe Bryant uh, is a tremendous leader because he has this, um, this, this desire to win. He has a desire to win that's unbelievable. Michael Jordan, again, just talking about on the court, was a great leader because uh, he just had this tremendous desire to win and uh, he would not accept cheating on the part of his teammates. He would not allow anybody to do less than their best to win. So I, I thought that, uh, and, and actually to be honest with you, I think LeBron James uh, has uh, become a, uh, a great leader. People like Cheryl Swoops, when she was playing, was a, a, great, a great leader. Um, I, I just, I just in, in sports, and again, you talk about on the field, I think that leaders are people um, who have this tremendous desire to win and, and, and just bring out, make everybody around them better. That after you finish playing with them, you realize that you're a lot better at the end than you were than when you came in. Why do you think Incognita was appointed to the position in the first place? And what does this say about our society as a whole? I think he was uh, appointed as leadership because uh, the Miami Dolphins have no leadership. I, th I think they have no judgment and no leadership, which is why a guy like that was appointed to leadership. Because that's like a guard having a, a, a fox guard the hen house. You say, well, who, who did that? You know, that, you know what I'm saying? That, that's essentially what they did. Why? Because I just think that the organization has no clue. Um, our final question would be, um, if you could talk about your experience as a whole for writing about uh, at the New York Times, uh, your experience, uh, like how's it been? <laughs> uh, it's been great. <laughs> no, the, uh, yeah, now I've had a, um, uh, the question was, uh, about my experience in the New York Times. Uh, it, like, it's been 32 years, so it's kind of hard to cram into like two minutes, but uh, all I can say has been um, a phenomenal, it's been a phenomenal experience. Uh, um, and um, it's an experience that I hope that a lot of young people who I come in contact uh, with uh, will, will also have. But it's been, it's been great. It's been A1, as they say. Um, do you believe that the coach really had no idea what was going on with Jonathan Martin? Martin? Um, I, I, I do not believe that. I, I don't believe that the coach did not know what was going on. If it's true that he didn't know what was going on, he should be fired. He should be fired. But I, I do think that he had a sense. Uh, he, I, I, I believe he did have a sense of what was going on. He just didn't think that it was s s serious enough to warrant his involvement. Um, some members of the audience believe that uh, they absolutely agree with the hazing process. Uh, how do you feel about hazing in general? Well, I disagree with most of the audience. Uh, no, I mean, uh, there, there was a degree, you know, again, from the time I was at school, there was an initiation process. Uh, and I think that it, if it serves a purpose to, to, for young people coming into an organization to learn something about the organization, to learn about the rules, the tradition, what it took for this organization to grow and that kind of, that's fine. But I think that when it gets into phys, you know, physical punishment, um, making people uh, uh, ill at ease, hurting people, uh, I'm, not, I'm not down with that at all. 
Uh, we just wanted to apologize that we cannot see questions from the outside audience, but we do want to thank Mr. Roden for his time, as well as the students who have attended. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure.